Morning, everybody. How are we doing today? It's uh, Thursday here in Minnesota. Uh, it's Thursday evening in Europe. Evening, folks. <clears throat> to all my American Canadian friends, good day to you guys. Good morning. Uh, I suppose by the time I get this published, it will be afternoon and late evening in uh, Europe. But uh, snowy day here in Minnesota. It's going to get 8 to 10 inches today, and then it's going to get cold. Uh, forget why I chose to live in Minnesota. Well, it wasn't really a choice. Uh, you kind of, the immigration thing happened from Canada to North Dakota, and this was the obvious next step for me. And I've left a few times from other places, but Minnesota's got all my connections, all my roots. My brothers and my mom are here. It would be tough to pick up a move at this point, not to mention my wife and her kids who have a family and relatives in the city of their own. So it's, I guess, not super much an option at this point. Well, even though the wife wants to get out pretty bad sometimes. Uh, we even talked about going back to Canada. Uh, sometimes pretty strongly, you know. Uh, that last president had us talking about going to Canada quite a bit. But it just feel, feels like it's unfinished business here. You know, my DJ business uh, had a fairly significant following in the Twin Cities and it just didn't feel like it was finished or resolved. And the cafe, which coffee shop, we're still working on it. It's been kind of a, in a pause during the holidays. My wife's not working a lot uh, with COVID issues. Uh, the guy at the college that was helping us with our business plan, he was sick for a while. It's just been kind of a crazy last six weeks to two months. But again, I think our application for this funding is going in this week. And so we should know within the month, I guess, if, uh, if we get that money, because it turns out we didn't have enough on our own, which was our initial uh, step forward. <clears throat> but we got deeper into that process and realized, hey, yeah, we're not going to have enough funding to be comfortable doing it. And so we've been reaching out for this Southern Minnesota funding, and we think we're looking good, but you never know until it actually goes down the pike, as they say. But uh, so <clears throat> there's, there's, and it's not like moving to Canada is going to be a ton uh, warmer. Although Vancouver is far milder than Minnesota. And believe it or not, Toronto is well south of here and is far more uh, mild in the wintertime than Minnesota is. Uh, and I'll be honest, Minnesota winters aren't even what they used to be. When I moved here in 91, it was, we had two of the biggest blizzards I've ever seen. One of them, we had like 29 inches of snow. And then it followed up with another 11 a few days after that and Halloween. And then that was at Halloween and Thanksgiving, we got like another 20 inches. <clears throat> that was my first winter here. And as a Canadian, I was like, God dang, you guys, you guys like snow in Minnesota. But uh, there was a few mid-90s winters that were so cold, uh, comparable often to uh, Canadian winters in Manitoba, which were, you know, we'd see 40 below for a few weeks on end sometimes. Manitoba has some cold winters. But even there, their winters are mild. I've, I've gotten softer. Uh, they say that the ice roads up there and the uh, winter lake ice for ice fishing is coming and going two weeks to a month earlier on both sides. Well, uh, Toronto is actually, like I said, quite a bit south of here because of, because of how the Great Lakes kind of jump down there by Lake Ontario. And Toronto's got that lake effect climate where the water will keep you somewhat cooler in the summer. Uh, again, it's not like the breezes come off the lake all the time because of where, where, how they're situated, but... And then in the wintertime, that water contains some warmth. And it kind of keeps you a little more mild and not as cold. Toronto doesn't get 40 below very often. Uh, Minnesota doesn't like it used to, but it still does at times. But anyway, enough about the weather. A little bit of snow wasn't going to hurt nobody. I got to play basketball two days ago. Uh, first time in almost three years I got to the gym. And I got a little half-court game in. Three, I played three little games. Uh... I didn't run too hard. I didn't want to be just as sore as the Dickens and hurt myself. It was still good to get a little sweat going and make a couple shots and uh, feel really out of shape. Uh, the mind was still there. I could feel what I wanted to do. It was just not as fluid as one would like. Uh, I'm going again today as long as the snow doesn't get too ridiculous. The wife has my car and I have hers. I don't really know how her car handles in the snow. Probably can't be too bad. This is Minnesota. They do plow things pretty quickly, but uh, yesterday I started a firestorm. Uh, I posted a Freddie Hubbard record on Facebook. Um, one of my favorite records going up. It's early Hubbard on Blue Note. Fantastic stuff. 
And those of you who know my channel know I'm a big Freddie Hubbard fan. I think he's one of the most, uh, I don't even want to even call it technically brilliant because I don't think it's technical. It's just he's proficient and efficient and precise and concise. Uh, he's incredibly dynamic and fluid. He's got the cleanest tone next to a guy like Clifford Brown. You know, Dizzy Gillespie is even a little bit uh, sharper and brighter. Hubbard's just kind of full mid-tone, <clears throat> well enunciated each tonal step. And he played such fluid lines that just have melodic and rhythmic interplay. And again, that's virtuosity isn't just about how many notes can you play. It's how melodically can you still phrase them? How rhythmically can you pulse them? Uh, those interwoven fabrics are what creates great playing and great emoting from a jazz player. And one of the tasks you can often do is if, if a guy's playing really fast, if you were to slow it down and play it markedly slower, is the phrasing there? Or is it just note after note after note stepping on top of each other without giving it room to have any shape or form? And I think Hubbard's one of the greatest at doing these stabbing lines and then Langwood relapse and then another stabbing series of notes and all was just this clean enunciation that's establishing some personality. He doesn't do things halfway, I don't get the feeling. Even in his personal life, I feel like he's a guy that completes tasks and organizes his constructions because he needs to have that shape, it just, that's how he plays, organized. And with these, like I said, shapes that interweave. My rhythmic shapes are gonna have pattern and my melodic and harmonic phrasings are going to interweave. And it's going to be interesting and complex, dynamic, without ever being difficult to listen to. Even on some of the more out recordings he's on, uh, or in like Coleman's Free, for example, he still is playing with such an interesting, uh, if, I, if memory serves me, he's also on the Oliver Nelson, uh, uh, early Oliver Nelson record on Impulse. I can't think of the name right now, Blues After I Truth, like, there it is. Uh, he's on that if I remember too. And so even in that, some abstract settings, he has this clarity and shape and he can't really abandon his rhythmic pulses. And I just find him to be such a dynamic. So anyway, I stirred the horn test a little bit yesterday because someone on my YouTube channel about a week ago commented on one of my old videos about how uh, Freddie Hubbard was not a better player than Miles Davis and that Miles Davis could take him into a room and teach him how to play. And it was kind of condescending almost towards Hubbard, but it was more just Miles Davis is the greatest ever from this guy. And those of you who know me know that I think Miles Davis is a great player. He's a great motor but he also has his limitations and he's not as great as we see him today because of the a mass amount of marketing behind it. We get so much more information about Miles. There's many more people shaping our opinions and thoughts about jazz through the lens of what Miles Davis accomplished and did and elevating his status because they represent him financially. So it's in their interest to make him seem greater than he was. Nobody in 1955 would have said in, in 50 years, Miles Davis is going to be the biggest name in jazz by bar none. No one. Uh, <clears throat> in 55, they'd have been saying Clifford Brown. You know what I mean? Uh, 1959? Who knows what they'd have been saying then? Maybe Coltrane? Miles was never atop of too many polls in terms of his playing abilities. And a lot of his designated genius and uh, the laurels that are placed on him for his innovations and being a great band leader. A lot of the evidence when you really stack it up and look at things year by year, look at the track record with his musicians, these things aren't really the case. And I come at that from being the biggest Miles Davis fan in the world when I was first in jazz. I had 200 jazz records and 50 of them were Miles Davis records. 40 of them were Coltrane records. Like, Miles was my in. And I know how it feels when you're in that, in that early stages of your learning about jazz. Miles is so omnipresent. But again, there's such a current marketing about him still 
that keeps him so on people's lips and in people's brains and have him so elevated it makes everybody feel entitled to speak about how great Miles was. Unless you have the entire context of what happened in those years and have a chronology in your mind of how these things played out. <clears throat> I mean, your opinion has to have some value. Do you have all the works from all these great labels in 53, 54, 55, 56, 57? Can you hear where innovations were and weren't? Who was really ahead of things? Who really deserves credit for things? And you could start with Jerry Mulligan and the uh, Birth of the Cool. Miles Davis gets so much credit for Birth of the Cool, which wasn't even called that until much later when Capitol goes, oh, we should really issue this. Miles is big now. This will probably do good. And it did for Capital, good for them. But Mulligan held a grudge for a long time from the sounds of what I've read and heard from Miles usurping and allowing the labels to kind of put his name out front when in no sense during the recording and during the, the writing and innovating was Miles really the driving force behind this thing. Again, there's a lot of players in there, Lee Connors, J.J. Johnson, uh, just a, a whole showboat of some of the best talent over those three sessions. And, of course, Miles does appear in all three sessions, which is part of what gives him uh, some licensure over leadership. But so was Jerry Mulligan. And Mulligan was the driving force behind that birth of the cool. And Mulligan was always kind of bitter that Capital put his name on it. Not, not his, but Miles. And that trend happens throughout Miles' career. And I'm not going to sit here and slag on Miles, because I do love a lot of what Miles did. I think he's fantastic, but... It's just ridiculous how many people are so out front and don't have, I don't think, as broad a scope of what's happening in jazz chronologically year to year and yet can speak with such conviction about Miles' greatness. And like even his, his uh, mute, Sweet Edison was the guy who said, that's how I'm going to do. I'm going to play behind Sinatra and, and Billy Holiday and so many of the greats of that era in the late 40s, early 50s, and Miles heard Sweets Edison doing it. You know, it's again, it's not about slagging Miles, but when this guy comments on my post um, on, on YouTube about how Miles Davis would teach Freddie Hubbard some things, I just, I was like, what? Have you, do you listen with your ears or with your eyes? I, and people want to talk about Hubbard being this bombastic flash of a player that was one-dimensional. I'm going to play you right now a ballad by the great Freddie Hubbard. That's going to show you some of his dynamic abilities. And again, I want to watch my volumes here because I don't want to get this thing demonetized. Uh, this is my income right now. I need this money. But... That's McCoy Tyner opening up the, the celebration here. And the song is called The Changing Scene. And we're going to hear Hubbard come in here and pierce the silence with this tonality. Reminiscent of Armstrong. Uh, again, that light that's kind of in there. A brightness and optimism. But even, even though this is melancholic, uh, the, the slight vibrato, it's gorgeous. Uh, I'm just going to pull it down for a second, we'll bring it back up. But he goes through these chords, stating minimally, melodically, emphatically, dynamically. Clarity is just unrivaled. He's a beautiful beautician that can play a ballad with the best of them. And what's fantastic about this is that he goes through his 16 bars, I believe it is, and then Hank Mobley comes in. And I've often spoken about Hank Mobley, the chameleon, before, how who he's playing with and what he's playing on. You would never hear Miles play that with such clean clarity enunciated tonality it would be kind of muddy and slurry and people often attribute that to him being uh artsy it, but it doesn't seem that way from, from a musician standpoint 
It sounds like a guy almost unsure of himself. And the pronounced, pronounced sounds of Hubbard's trumpet here shows you just how proficient he was at playing at slow tempo. And anybody can tell you. It's playing at fast tempos where your mistakes are easily hidden. You miss a note, the next one's there so quickly that it's hard to pick out what you missed. But when it comes to something like a ballad with a slow tempo, if you're a drummer that can't keep time, that slow tempo is going to show up. You're off timing. It's going to, uh, I, I try to play the click track myself and I'm recording to you numerous times and it was not easy for me. Uh, but it's true for any musician. You know what I mean? And uh, Hubbard, oh, and then. Again, yeah, let's listen to that again when he comes in there. Beautiful, clean tonality. And here comes Fred. I mean, here comes Hank. There's a lot of Ben Webster and a lot of. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm trying to blank here. Ben Webster and Lester Young in what uh, Hank Moby's doing right there. And that's the links that you hear when you listen to the broader spectrum of this jazz canon. You can really tangibly hear when players are channeling or being influenced by one of their predecessors. And of course, Webster and, and Lester Young were two of the biggest impacts on the tenor saxophone. You know, aside from Coleman Hawkins, who's probably the preeminent voice. And Lester and uh, Webster both borrow from Coleman to some degree, even though they were largely contemporaries. But it's uh, that breathy, moist, contemplative, melancholic sound that Mobley can channel at times so brilliantly. That's the lineage. And you can feel those different branches of the tree the deeper you dive in. And I think if people just stay in that miles pool, you're really kind of in the shallow end. Because there's a whole lot more stuff deeper down in the history that links and proves merit and evaluates talent far beyond what the Miles Kingdom was about. And again, I'm a huge Miles Davis fan. I'm not slagging Miles. It's just he allowed in his lifetime some things to be... Uh, credited him that he knew he didn't deserve credit for. And in posthumous years, the label and the industry, Columbia, have given him so much more credit because he's one of the few names that are still being pushed out there for consumption. So you just start giving him more and more of the jazz roof, that this guy was the roof over the entire thing. And it's just not the case. It's just not. It's... And again, I will play Miles Davis records frequently. And at the same time, I'll challenge you to be like, what's the most innovative Miles Davis record? And there's almost always something that you can be like, well, that's innovative because so-and-so, or because he's following something else over here, so-and-so did. You know, it's it's not like some guys be like, well, this is purely standing on its own, like a Thelonious Monk or Charles Mingus, you know what I mean, or, or Jimmy Joffrey. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, the reason, the reason why we're here is talking about Hubbard. And just how I recognize how versatile a player Freddie Hubbard was. Sure, he can play those fiery up tempo numbers. And even at CTI, he makes some of the best records that that label makes. Fantastic work at CTI. Because he's just Freddie Hubbard. I mean, we've talked about Red Clay a few times before. I'll take Red Clay all day long over Bitches Brew. You know, and his Atlantic work is great. Uh Everything Hubbard really touches, you know, but his Blue Note catalog is just legendary. And it gets better and better with time. And you listen to enough Clifford Brown, you listen to enough Freddie Hubbard, uh, Booker Little, some of the real clean, clear enunciators. Suddenly that muddy, almost sloppy, almost disinterested sound of Miles at times. He seems so lethargic. Like, is he going to even get to the note? Is he even going to bother to find the tonal center? Or is he just kind of skirting around it? And you might say some of that's by design, and maybe some of it is. And obviously with a blues guitarist, you are doing a lot of that. But uh, 
I think, I think as a musician, you can feel the difference between intent and almost like a lethargic disinterest or perhaps even an uncertainty. Uh, <clears throat> again, I, I enjoy Miles' muted stuff a lot. And again, but that's taken from someplace else quite as much as well. But anyway, Hubbard deserves all the praise in the world. And he's capable of playing at this tempo with the best of them. And you got to just have this record. You know, the changing scene is great, but Asiatic Rays is great. Uh, a, pack of, a pack of sack is great. You got to love Hubbard. And like Tyner, Mobley, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. These lineups are just so iconic, so classic for that era. And some of the best music that's ever been made, in my mind. I've been trying to branch out with the channel and find some other people to work with. Uh, but honestly, a lot of people are hesitant because, oh, if we talk jazz, I won't get the viewership. And I'm like, man. And I'm stuck here kind of stagnating in my growth in some ways. Because I'm staying so singular in how, what we talk about. We're talking about jazz. And it's really what I want to talk about for the most part. But uh, it's funny that a lot of people who are such love music lovers are so unwilling to talk jazz. Because there's not enough interest in jazz. Yet how do we drum up interest if we don't talk about it? Uh, me and Ken are going to do another episode soon. So stay tuned for that. I appreciate all you guys. I'm heading back to the gym today. Like I said, if the roads are good. Uh, Y'all be safe. I will talk to you soon. I got some fun stuff that I'm working on. Trading cards are coming along slowly but surely. I'm almost a third of the way done now with the backs and re-editing the fronts. So, we'll keep you posted on that. Check out the merchandise store on the bottom. If you have a cool idea for a Jazz Shepherd t-shirt idea, message me. Let me th think about it. I, I kind of have in my mind something uh, with the Shepherd's Cane, with records, with uh, fall of the shepherd. I'm trying to find something that's just kind of catchy. And I, I figure I just appeal to you guys. See if any of you guys have any great ideas. Uh, if not, no big deal. Y'all be safe. Talk to you soon. Peace.